Welcome back to episode two of the DRC Diaries. If you guys haven't gone and watched the first episode, please go ahead and do so. Right here, go ahead and click and watch that first episode and then come back and then watch this episode. I show you guys a flying video of one of the first flights that my captain Hannah and I did when I first, first joined. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Also, if you're interested in supporting me and you enjoying the content that I'm creating, I do have a link to my Patreon. I would really, really appreciate that. And that's probably the best way that you guys can do so. I do have a discount code for a cut above pilot shirts. If you guys want to go ahead and use that code, it is also in the description down below and you guys get a 15% discount. Please go ahead and subscribe. So on to the flying, because I know that's what you guys are all here for. So the flying was so, so different. It was very different than what I'd been used to flying in Canada. <music> So one of the first things that was very, very noticeable is the fact that for most of the flying that we were doing, it was all non-radar environment. What? So for most of you guys, you're like, what? Like, what does that even, how does it, how do you do this? So it's non-controlled towers for a lot of the places. That's something that people are kind of familiar with. So it's kind of like your mandatory frequency environment. So you're not getting clearances per se from the tower. You're simply advising. Now, their understanding of what clearances were is a little bit different. So sometimes they were of the mindset that they are giving us clearances, but that's a whole other story. The biggest thing that comes from that is basically like old school position reporting. Now the controllers don't have a radar the way that we are used to having a radar. They have positions and pins. So every time that you're doing position reports, they are moving you along. Now, this made for some really interesting interactions. The airmanship wasn't necessarily the same as what you're kind of used to here. So let's just say that there was sometimes a tendency for certain aircraft to report further ahead to where they were so they would get the clearance to land ahead of you, whereas you were actually ahead of them. So it made for some really interesting conflicts. When we did actually head to Uganda, that was actually fully radar, fully controlled. So, you know, we could actually shoot ILSs down into Entebbe, into Uganda, whereas like the other approaches, most of them were visual approaches backed up with, say, a VOR. One of the things that was quite challenging flying in the DRC was just the humidity and the heat that we were dealing with. You know, you're just sweating your butt off. There is no APU in the aircraft that I was personally flying. The GPUs weren't their greatest, depending on where you were. Overall, it was still a really cool experience. And some of the other places that we flew, in case you're curious, so you can look it up. There was Goma, Bukavu, Entebbe, Bunia, Kalimi, Beni. Sometimes, like in Entebbe in Uganda, there are nice paved runways, whereas if you go to Beni, it was definitely a dirt strip. Another thing that was really different that some of you guys might be more familiar with was our flying in terms of the weather. Lots of thunderstorms. I'm talking like quick development. Because we're near the equator, we're actually dealing with just pop-up thunderstorms. So they had nothing to do with front. And the challenge with flying in this environment too is that we would try to avoid being in IMC as much as possible because once you're in IMC, if you guys you know are familiar with weather radar systems, they are only picking up what's kind of surrounding them. So the, the moisture that is getting picked up from the weather radar is just what you're in. But the downside is that once you're already in an environment that has high moisture, it can't actually pick up worse moisture or worse thunderstorms in the distance. So we really, really try to avoid being in IMC because we couldn't actually tell how bad some of the cells were. So that was another thing that we had to really kind of dodge and weave around and plan our descents accordingly based on the surrounding thunderstorms. The flight, I will show you guys just some clips of a takeoff that my captain and I, Hannah, did. Hannah is the one that's flying and then I'm the pilot monitoring. I think it's one of our first flights.
minimum. So next part, another amazing, amazing, cool thing that I got to do. Hike into the middle of the Congolese jungle to go find some Eastern lowland gorillas. I will never forget this experience. We set out early morning with the crew and we drove out to Kahuzi Biega National Park. I said it wrong in the video. <laughs> Excited to see the gorillas. I'm super pumped. So we're here in Kazubi Biega National Park and we're gonna be going on a nice little trek soon to get to see some silverback gorillas. You actually have to contact the rangers in the national park because they actually have to go and find some of the, the gorilla tribes to have a general idea of where they are. This park is thousands of square kilometers. It is a huge park and there are numerous tribes that they've identified. There's two specific tribes that have come to get quite comfortable with humans interacting with them and those are the tribes that they try to specifically seek out because the other tribes don't want to interact with them too much so that they don't disturb their natural environment and their habits. We actually have to head on the back of a pickup just hanging on for dear life just ripping through on these back roads. At the beginning of this hike, they had mentioned sometimes it takes 30 minutes to find the tribe. Sometimes it takes up to three hours. So we were just kind of ready and had no expectations as to what was going to be happening. And this was like out of a dream, just having the guides just like hack through the bamboo sticks with their machete through the jungle to find the path where they had kind of an idea of where one of the tribes was hanging out. We eventually got to a spot where there was one small half of a tribe of family. Because they were actually feeding a younger baby, the park rangers told us, let's not hang around, we're going to go find a different tribe because we don't want to disturb them. So we hiked a little bit more, kept hacking through the jungle to eventually make it out to this opening, this clearing, where we found another tri that tribe of gorilla that they wanted to find. Ah, 
<laughs> and there was the youngest gorilla, the baby, who was about, I think, a year and a half. And I remember the gorilla just looking at me and his eyes like would look right at mine. In that moment, that feeling of knowing that this other being was just looking at me. Like the intelligence in those gorillas is mind blowing. We made our way a little bit kind of further and then we saw the actual main silverback gorilla that we witnessed was over like 500 pounds. That, that guy was huge, absolutely unfazed. These guides, by the way, were all with AK-47s. I've never seen more AK-47s in my entire life than when I spent two months in the Congo, side note. We only spent about like, I wanna say 15, 20 minutes, but at this point, it had already been an hour and a bit for our hike to, to get to see them. The, the guides are quite good with not wanting to spend too much time or get too close with humans. After about 15, 20 minutes, we set out on, on the rest of our hike. Such a cool experience to see silverback gorillas. Thank you so much for watching and please subscribe to the channel. Please stick around and watch out for episode three coming out shortly. I'm really excited to show you guys the last and the final episode where I do just casually hike a volcano. I will see you in the next video. Thank you.